Chapter 3 of Badge of Infamy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Badge of Infamy by Lester Del Rey. Read by Stephen H. Wilson of Prometheus Radio Theater. www.prometheusradiotheater.com. 3. Spaceman. Most crewmen lived rough, ugly lives, and usually short ones. Passengers and officers on the big tubs were given the equivalent of gravity in spinning compartments, but the crews rode free. The lucky crewmen lived through their accidents, got space stomach now and then, and recovered. Nobody cared about the others. Feldman's ticket was work stamped for the Navajo, and nobody questioned his identity. He suffered through the agony of acceleration on the shuttle up to the orbital station, then was sick as acceleration stopped. But he was able to control himself enough to follow other crewmen down a hall of the station toward the Navajo. The big ships never touched a planet, always docking at the stations. A checker met the crew and reached for their badges. He barely glanced at them, punched a mark for each on his checkoff sheet, and handed them back. Deckman forward, Tubman to the rear, he ordered. Navajo blasts in fifteen minutes. Hey, you! Your tubes. Feldman grunted. He should have expected it. Tube men had the lowest lot of all the crew. Between the killing work, the heat of the tubes, and the occasional doses of radiation, their lives weren't worth the metal value of their tickets. He began pulling himself clumsily along a shaft, dodging freight the loaders were tossing from hand to hand. A bag hit his head drawing blood, and another caught him in the groin. "'Watch it, Bo!' a loader yelled at him. "'You dent that bag and they'll brig you. Can't you see it's got a special courtesy stripe?' It had a brilliant green stripe, he saw. It also had a name, printed in block letters, that shouted their identity before he could read the words. Dr. Christina Ryan, Southport, Mars. And he had chosen this time to leave Earth." Suddenly, he was glad he was assigned to the tubes. It was the one place on the ship where he'd be least likely to run into her. As a doctor and a courtesy passenger, she'd have complete run of the ship, but she'd hardly bother with the dangerous and unpleasant tube section. He dragged his way back, beginning to sweat with the effort. The Navajo was an old ship. A lot of the handholds were missing, and he had to throw himself along by erratic leaps. He was gaining proficiency, but not enough to handle himself if the ship blasted off. Time was growing short when he reached the aft bunk room where the other tube men were waiting. Ben, one husky introduced himself. Tube chief. Know how to work this? Feldman could see that they were assembling a small still. He'd heard of the phenomenal quantities of beer spacemen drank, and now he realized what really happened to it. Hard liquor was supposed to be forbidden, but they made their own. I can work it, he decided. Um, I'm Dan. Okay, Dan. Ben glanced at the clock. Hit the sacks, boys. By the time Feldman could settle into the sack-like hammock, the Navajo began to shake faintly, and weight piled up. It was mild compared to that on the shuttle, since the big ships couldn't take high acceleration. Space had been conquered for more than a century, but the ships were still flimsy tubs that took months to reach Mars using immense amounts of fuel. Only the valuable plant hormones from Mars made commerce possible at the ridiculously high freight rate. Three hours later, he began to find out why spacemen didn't seem to fear dying or turning pariah. The tube quarters had grown insufferably hot during the long blast, but the main tube room was blistering as Ben led the men into it. The chief handed out spacesuits and motioned for Dan. Greenhorn, ain't you? Okay, I'll take you with me. We go out in the tubes and pull the lining. I pry up the stuff, you carry it back and stack it. They sealed off the tube room, pumped out the air, and went into the steaming, mildly radioactive tubes, just big enough for a man on his hands and knees. Beyond the tube mouth was empty space, waiting for the man who slipped. Ben began ripping out the eroded blocks with a special tool. Feldman carried them back and stacked them along with the others. A plasma furnace melted them down into new blocks. The work grew progressively worse as the distance to the tube room increased. 
The tube mouth yawned closer and closer. There were no handholds there, only the friction of a man's body in the tube. Life settled into a dull routine of labor, sleep, and the brief relief of the crude white mule from the still. They were six weeks out and almost finished with the tube cleaning when number two tube blew. Bits of the remaining radioactive fuel must have collected slowly until they reached the blow point. Feldman in number one would have gone sailing out into space, but Ben reacted at once. As the ship leaped slightly, Feldman brought up sharply against the chief's braced body. For a second, their fate hung in the balance. Then it was over, and Ben shoved him back, grinning faintly. He jerked his thumb and touched helmets briefly. There they go, Dan. The two men who had been working in number two were charred lumps, drifting out into space. No further comment was made on it, except that they'd have to work harder from now on, since they were shorthanded. That rest period, Feldman came down with a mild attack of space stomach, which meant no more drinking for him, and was off work for a day. Then the pace picked up. The tubes were cleared, and they began laying the new lining for the landing blasts. There was no time for thought after that. Mars Orbital Station lay close when the work was finished. Ben slapped Feldman on the back. He ain't bad for a greenie, Dan. We all get six-day passes on Mars. Hit the sack now so you won't waste time sleeping then. We'll hear it when the ship berths. Feldman didn't hear it, but the others did. He felt Ben shaking his shoulder, trying to drag him out of the sack. Grab your junk, Dan. Ben picked up Feldman's nearly empty bag and tossed it toward him before his eyes were fully open. He grabbed for it and missed. He grabbed again with Ben's laughter in his ears. The bag hit the wall and fell open, spilling its contents. Feldman gathered it up, but the chief was no longer laughing. A big hand grabbed up the space ticket suddenly, and there was no friendliness now on Ben's face. Art Billings card, Ben told the other tubeman. Five trips I made with Art. He was saving his money. Want to buy a farm on Mars? Five trips and one more to go before he had enough. Now you show up with his ticket? The tubeman moved forward toward Feldman. There was no indecision. To them, apparently, trial had been held and sentence passed. Wait a minute, Feldman began. Billings died of... A fist snaked past his raised hand and connected with his jaw. He bounced off a wall. A wrench sailed toward him, glanced off his arm, and ripped at his muscles. Another heavy fist struck. Abruptly, Ben's voice cut through their yells. Hold it! He shoved through the group, tossing men backwards. Stow it! We can take care of him later. Right now, this is captain's business. You fools want to lose your leave? He indicated two of the others. You two, bring him along and keep him quiet. The two grabbed Feldman's arms and dragged him along as the chief began pulling his way forward through the tubes up towards the control section of the ship. Feldman took a quick glance at their faces and made no effort to resist. They obviously would have enjoyed any chance to subdue him. They were stopped twice by minor officers, then sent on. They finally found the captain near the exit lock, apparently assisting the passengers to leave. Most of them went on into the shuttle, but Chris Ryan remained behind as the captain listened to Ben's report and inspected the false ticket. Finally, the captain turned to Feldman. You, what's your name? Chris's eyes were squarely on Feldman, cold and furious. He was Dr. Daniel Feldman, Captain Marker, she stated. Feldman stood paralyzed. He'd been unwilling to face Chris. He wanted to avoid all the past. But the idea that she would denounce him had never entered his head. There was no medical rule involved. She knew that, as a pariah, he was forbidden to board a passenger ship, of course but she'd been his wife once. Marker bowed slightly to her. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. I should take this criminal back to Earth in chains, I suppose, but he's hardly worth the freightage. You men, want to take him down to Mars and ground him there? Ben grinned and touched his forelock. Thank you, sir. We'd enjoy that. Good. His pay reverts to the ship's fund. That's all, men. Feldman started to protest but a fist lashed savagely against his mouth. He made no other protests as they dragged him into the crew shuttle that took off for Southport. He avoided their eyes and sat hunched over. 
It was Ben who finally broke the silence. What happened to Art's money? He had a pile on him. Go to hell. Give, I said. Ben twisted his arm back toward his shoulder, applying increasing pressure. A doctor took it for his fee when Billings died a space stomach. Damn you, I couldn't help him. Ben looked at the others. Med lobby fee, eh? All the market will take. Hmm. Could be. Maybe. He shrugged. Okay. Reasonable doubt. We won't kill you, Bo. Not quite, we won't. The shuttle landed, and Ben handed out the little helmets and aspirators that made life possible in Mars's thin air. Outside, the tubemen took turns holding Feldman and beating him while the passengers disembarked from their shuttle. As he slumped into unconsciousness, he had a picture of Chris Ryan's frozen face as she moved steadily toward the port station. End recording.